And we hope that you get informed, get involved, and help us to stop battle here and destroy their hospital in this county. Everybody told me, said, Joe, now you be nice. Well, my grandmother once told me a long time ago, she says, be nice until it's time to not be nice. And right now, it's time to not be nice. We have, just in this city, over 7,000 men and women who get up and go to work today in three major industries. And if there's a mass casualty incident, and there's a level one trauma center only in Johnson City, people are going to die because of the transport time to get there. That's why I'm involved, is for those folks. Just in the event, and hopefully there won't anything happen, but by summer we almost have one. And so that reason, alone is why Houston Valley needs to stay as a level one promise. <laughs> Millions of dollars were spent on Houston Valley to make a premier ER with 42 beds. And reason number two is just that. There's 42 beds there and 14 beds at Johnson City Medical Center. Are they going to spend, is that what we mean, going to spend millions of dollars to expand that ER? Yeah. See, yeah, I know. You can move out with me, you know. I was hoping you'd show up, but I don't see you here. I want to uh, thank a few folks. I want to thank Sheriff Jeff Cassidy for helping with the city's deputies to provide security. Uh, very grateful for providing the sound. Uh, Roger Jones also is here to help provide security and Ben Castle provided our stage. And then the city of Kingsport for letting us have this event. So without further ado, I want to introduce to you uh, Pastor Phil Woodward uh, to give the invitation.
Folks, Sullivan County and Hawkins County are suffering. But Southwest Virginia, it's a whole different story. So before we get into a whole lot tonight, if you're an elected official from Virginia or Tennessee or any other state that might happen to be here, I'd like for you to stand up right now. Any elected official. Look at that. We like our food fried, we like our tobacco, and some 
mothers every now and then like a dream. We have bad health care. Everybody's responsible for that. But I don't need Valor to tell me that. I don't need Valor to get up. I can tell you if it's going to save businesses and industries money, it's going to cost me money and cost me services. There are things that we can do every day that Valley can do every day to reduce costs without destroying Southern County. Because folks, south of the Southern County line, nobody's being affected. It's north of the Southern County, Washington County line, into Virginia, down south into, or west into Hawkins and Hancock County, and east into Washington County, Smith County, Dickens County. Nowhere else. Southern County is giving, 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 and Washington County and Johnson City is gaining, gaining, gaining. But I want to be clear about this one. Folks in Washington County, Carter County, Unicoi County, Johnson County deserve a level one trauma center and their health care as much as we do. It's not about them. But why destroy others? I used to be hesitant about saying Valley doesn't care. But over the last five weeks, I think they proved that. They don't care about what happens to Sullivan, Hawkins, Hancock. They don't care what happens to Southwest Virginia. Well, we do. So we need you folks to keep talking to your elected officials, to keep the pressure on them, keep the pressure on ballots, sending the emails that we ask you to to the uh, state of Tennessee. Danny will touch more on that. She's the expert there. We need you folks to get behind us. We need you folks to stay behind us. We saw what kind of battle the school system was in Monsalva County for the last two years. But folks, this is going to be a battle as well. And there's a tough question that you folks are going to have to start asking yourself because we've had this conversation and we've had to start asking ourselves the same question. What do we expect our health care system to look like? Because I, I hate to tell you, if you haven't realized it, but the well is gone. It's not coming back. Mountain States is gone. It's not coming back. Nobody in the state, the president, nobody's going to wave a magic wand and it's all going to be the same because it's gone. What's the right answer? Well, I truly believe the right answer is about it. It's a whole new management team, a whole new board of directors, that has objective decision making and not subject to it. That it's going to look out for the entire region, not just one area. So you need to be thinking about those things and you need to realize that we're up here fine, but we're not going to be able to fix everything. There's things we may have influence over, but there's multiple problems out there. And as much as we'd like to wave that magic wand, it's not going to it's like the hyena eating the elephant, it's one bite at a time. So the quicker you come to that realization and the quicker that you realize that what we had before is not going to be what we have in the future, maybe you can help us understand. We don't have the answers. There's people more qualified in this state. We've got a new government that's coming in. And I certainly hope and pray that he makes the right decisions with his cabinet positions, his department heads, that can help us fix the wrongs. So if he doesn't, you need to be yelling, you need to be screaming, and you need to be kicking. So that's what I've got for you today. And uh, I'm getting ready to introduce somebody to you that has become an internet rock star, Facebook rock star. He, um, he doesn't even have Facebook, but people comment on him all the time and want to tag him, and they can, and I'm going to give you this. For those of you that don't know Dr. Spivey, I'm going to give you a little bit of background from him. Uh, Dr. Spivey was born and raised in Kingsport. He's a 1972 graduate at Dawkins Minute High School. And after he graduated high school, he began working at Southern County Ambulance Service, which is now Southern County EMS. Uh, he attended Tennessee Tech University, where he worked for Putnam County Ambulance, and it was there where he took his first EMT training, and the first year it was available in Tennessee. On um, coming back to Kingsport, he became the 
first EMT to become employed by Sullivan County. He continued work with the ambulance service in Kingsport Life Secondary through college and medical school and was chosen for the first class of medical students at ETSU College of Medicine. Following his internship in general surgery and residency in emergency medicine in Columbia, South Carolina, Dr. Spivey, Mickey, as we like to call him, returned home and he was the first residency trained emergency physician in our area. He was medical director of JCMC Emergency Department from 1985 to 96 and was assistant director, medical director at Houston Valley Hospital Medical Center in the Emergency Department from 1986 to 1989. He was medical director at Houston Valley from 1990 to 2005, at which time he became medical director at Indian Path uh, until his recent retirement. Uh, he had a major role in the startup and development of Level 1 Trauma Center in Hudson Valley. Folks, there's another lady in our audience that was also deeply involved with that program with uh, Dr. Spivey. Ms. Sykes, would you stand up?
so that we can do what all of us want us to do, and that's to say Christ. Before I get started, I do want to talk a little bit about the Valley of the Trauma Plan. But let's talk, there, there are some good things about the Valley of the Trauma Plan that I would like to acknowledge. One of those things is the pediatric trauma center. I think all of us can support the idea of the pediatric trauma center. The other thing we're going to talk about is the new pediatric emergency departments in Bristol and in Kingsville. And that too sounds like a wonderful idea. And I hope that it will be a great idea. But the things that we need to ask is number one is how are they going to staff this pediatric emergency department? Will they have specialty trained pediatric emergency physicians? Or will they have other providers in telemedicine telemedicine or video conferencing to not And then the second thing is we need to ask is Will it be staffed 24-7, 365 days, or will it be staffed only a few hours of a few days a week? Hopefully it will not be the latter. If it is the latter, then that basically, in my opinion, is extremely dangerous marketing. Now, let's talk about the part of the Valley Trauma Plan that to me is just totally unacceptable. And that's the downgrade of Hosta Valley's Level 1 Trauma Center, the Bristol Regional Level 1 Trauma Center to level three trauma centers. Folks, in my opinion, that is too drastic of a change for the safety of the people in that region. And I'd like to explain that to you, and try to help you understand why. You know, we all understand that trauma centers save lives, they improve outcomes, but that's provided that patients can receive timely access to definitive care. The American College of Surgeons states that a Risk of death can be decreased by almost 25% if a person can receive definitive care at a level one trauma center within 60 minutes of entry. That's the golden hour of trauma that we've all heard about. Ladies and gentlemen, rural trauma, which most of their area is rural trauma, accounts for 60% of all trauma deaths. So timely access to definitive care is absolutely crucial. That timely access to definitive care is very difficult to achieve in that area. You know, our mountainous terrain, and as you guys have seen, you know, the weather in relation to our mountainous terrain and our winding roads make air transport and even ground transport less efficient in this part of the country than it does in the other parts of the country. And because of that, I think that it's absolutely essential that all of our trauma centers remain, and not only do they remain in Kingsport, and in Bristol, and in Johnson City, but they need to remain capable. Let me show you something here just a bit. And again, my high tech, I'm sorry. And I know that you guys can't really read this from out there. Is this echoing really bad? Uh, some say people are saying yes. So. Okay, this is basically the ballot service map. Okay, the ballot service area map. Virginia and Tennessee. And I want you to look at the relationship between Johnson City Medical Center, Houston Valley Medical Center, and Bristol Regional Medical Center. Well, let's just talk a minute about that here a minute. Houston Valley service area has traditionally been the greater Kingsport area. Then down west of the 11th W corridor into Hawkins County. And then northward, 23, all the way up through Scotland, Rise, and all the way up into Harlan, and even Ledger County, Kentucky. That's a large area. Okay? Then we look at Bristol Regional, which is situated in the central part of the Valley Service area, just like it was in the Valley. Then did the Bristol surrounding area, and then the I-81 corridor north. Well, that's what you need to learn. But if you look at that, it's pretty... This is one of our NICU nurses. And almost two nurses. That's family and Heather Pass. It's closer to Houston, or closer to Bristol than it is to Johnson City. So I think most of us, or many of us, would have thought, well, if we're going to choose one of one trauma center to represent the entire region, we would probably choose that trauma center that is best located, most capable, 
providing the highest quality of care to the most people in the region. That's the only reason. I would think so. Obviously, other factors came into play. And I think one of those factors that came into play was the fact that the Level 1 trauma center in Johnson City, in combination with their perinatal center in Johnson City, qualifies Johnson City Medical Center as a safety net hospital in the state of Tennessee. That's very important, okay? There's only six safety net hospitals in the state of Tennessee, but what it means to Ballot Health is millions and millions of dollars that comes into Ballot Health every year. That's extremely important, obviously, to any healthcare system, but so are lives. So if we go back and we look at this service map again, and we now see that this level one trauma center is probably the least appropriate located geographically. Wouldn't you think if you were doing that, if you cared, you would feel compelled to make sure that the other people and the other two thirds, the service area were well taken care of? Yeah, I would. But what has Ballard done? Ballard has just taken the opposite thing. They say, we're going to take these hospitals, Oster Valley and Bristol Regional, which are closest to the greatest number of people in this region, and now we're going to downgrade those to a level three. A level three trauma center, which is the lowest trauma center in this state. Wow. And I expected changes, but I think none of my colleagues expected that kind of a drastic change in a reduction in trauma center. Let me tell, explain to you why I, I think that's so important. We need to understand trauma center levels and what they mean. In the state of Tennessee, there's three different trauma center levels, one, two, and three. Level one is the highest. It's just the opposite for the NICU that you'll hear later. But for a trauma center, level one is the highest. It has the most requirements. But we're gonna make it pretty simple here. A level one trauma center requires 28 specialists to be on call 24-7. Five of those have to be in house 24 7. A level two trauma center, which has similar capabilities of a level one, requires a few less specialists to be available. 24 specialists to be available 24 7. Both the level one and the level two, by Tennessee definition, provide optimal care to the acute care, the acute injury trauma patient. Then we look at the level three, where a level one requires 28 specialists. Level two requires 24 specialists available. A level three, ladies and gentlemen, requires four specialties to be available 24 7. Four. And of those four, orthopedics, neurosurgery, and not even radiology is included to be a level three trauma center. That's way too drastic for a change. Let me talk a little bit more about the trauma center levels. A level one and level two trauma center do far more than provide surgical specialties for trauma care. Of those 24 and 28 specialties that are required in level one and level two center, 11 of those specialties are actually medical specialties. Cardiology, pulmonary medicine, gastroenterology, hematology, infectious diseases, internal medicine, nephrology, pathology, peds, psychiatry, radiology. A level three requires one, and that's internal medicine. Again, I think you can see my concern because of the drastic changes that we're going from a level one with all these specialties available to a level three. And I think that you can understand that these requirements, one of the few things that all we have about it, these requirements not only help guarantee that these trauma centers provide actual trauma care, but it also helps guarantee that they provide excellent medical care as well. And that's hugely important to the two-thirds of the ballot service area that are out there. The majority needs and have depended on most of Valley and Bristol Regional for decades. These specialists, they own call 24-7. They also pay 
what's called local utilities positions, which are traveling specialists, to be on call and to, if there's a vacancy in a farm or on call list, okay? You understand that these minimal requirements of the level three trauma center, with only four specialties required to be available 24-7, substantially reduces their obligation, and as such, it obviously reduces their cost. I think that plays a tremendous role in why they are choosing to make the level one and level two as the level three trauma center. How does that actually impact you guys? Well, this is important for you to understand too. Now I'm gonna try to pull up some more maps here. Be nice if I had a PowerPoint. I did need to have my grandkids to help me here, so I have to tell us. This is really important, okay? Now I know this is a little bit complicated, but it's really important, especially for the people in Kingsport and Sullivan County to understand something. Both Tennessee and Virginia has destination guidelines. They're called a little different state to state, but the same thing. In Tennessee, basically said that certain patients with certain vital signs at the scene or with certain specific injuries are required to be transported to a level one trauma center. That level one trauma center is within 30 minutes unless it's refused by the patient or it's overridden by medical control. This map, and I know that you can't see this, and we'll put it up here where you can look at it again, but this map shows that 30-minute driving time radius of the Johnson City Medical Center. What I want you to look at here is if you, basically, this is 81, 26, and this is basically the Eastern Star exit. Well, the Eastern Star exit on the east has always been in the Johnson City Medical Center territory. When you look at the rest of this map of where this impact is going to be, and what is it? It's the city of Kingsport and the whole part of Sullivan County. That's the folks that are going to be impacted. So what does that mean? That means that if you're in downtown Kingsport and you're involved in an accident and you are determined by these triage criteria to be a level one patient, which is different than the type of patients that Valley talks about, and you will be required to be transported to Johnson City Medical Center to be in the hospital. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, not only does that increase transportation time to meet that endangered patient's lives, but it also takes a very valuable EMS resource out of the mission for an extended period of time. And those of you that are firefighters and EMTs and paramedics in here, you all realize that many times our EMS agencies are working at capacity or near capacity almost every day. And when we start taking these units out of service, that may mean that back home in their own counties, that other emergency calls may be delayed and being answered. That puts everybody at risk. That's just not the stuff. But in the King's form, it's a double whammy. And I want you to understand why this is a double whammy. Think of who founded at some of the public meetings talk about an organized EMS services or whatnot. Well, they don't know what they're talking about. The city of Kingsport has an excellent EMS service, probably one of the best in the nation. Kingsport Fire Department answers first responder calls for the city of Kingsport. On every Kingsport fire truck, there are three personnel, all of which are trained medical personnel, and on each fire truck, there's a paramedic. The city of Kingsport had a paramedic on every fire truck two years before L.A. County did. Ladies and gentlemen, that's important and that's something that we are all to be proud of for the citizens of Kingsport that have that kind of service. We also have Sullivan County EMS, which is a county owned, county operated service that has a paramedic on each one of their ambulances. Okay? And then we also have the Kingsport Washington crew which is a specialty rescue agency for Kingsport and Sullivan County. And they have specialized rescue equipment, especially heavy rescue equipment, which is very important with the car accidents and stuff that they have to deal with. So anytime that there is an accident or injury inside the city, you have a fire truck, you have a Sullivan County EMS, and then you have the Kingsport Life Center for your own health. Why? It's because a single critically injured patient often requires multiple people, highly trained people, 
working simultaneously to try to take care of that person to save their lives. That year doesn't stop what we see. And what happens in the team sport is very often those people, those, that paramedic in the fire department and another person from the fire department will go in an ambulance with Sloan County EMS to help deliver this care all the way to the trauma center. Well, that not only takes the ambulance out of service, but it also takes the fire department out of service as well. That hasn't been a problem in the team sport because the transport times from the scene to the trauma center is very short. But now, the Postal Valley being downgraded to a level three trauma center and stuff having to go to Johnson City, I doubt that the city of Kingsport is going to be able to allow a fire truck to be taken out of the mission of the FBI. So what does that mean? That means that now we have citizens from the city of Kingsport, whether you work, live, or travel through here, now having to be transported further with possibly less help and route. It's a dangerous combination. It's a dangerous, dangerous combination right there, and you're undoubtedly going to land in that land. That's what I'm talking about in Delaware Valley. And that's also true for folks in Solomon County. They have a very similar operation with the fact that they, their first, first providers are actually coming from the volunteer fire department, but it's also a very excellent, well organized system. So with Delaware Valley, then you look at the city of Kings Ward and you say, well, only part of the city of Kingsport is in this big group, this 30 minute radius. So if you look at it from about Glen Garden Drive, or at least from where 26 goes around Kingsport, from there westward, you're outside of that 30 minute period. So what happens there? Well, it means that you don't have to go to Johnson City. But then what? It means that you may very well need to go to Johnson City because as a level three trauma center, you're only required four different specialties to be available. You have no guarantee that that's what is going to be available in the Tuscan Valley. And that's what we're trying to prevent. We need to have strong, capable, high quality trauma care available in Kingsport and in Bristol, again, to service all of these areas. Bristol has a very similar situation. Bristol is totally outside of that 30 minute destination guideline window. But Bristol, Virginia, because of Virginia requirements, is right in the middle of it. So you could have on one side of State Street, on the Virginia side, and Andrew having to go to Johnson City, on the other side, in Tennessee, not having to go. You can see the confusion that it creates for EMS personnel out in the field. And we can correct that with a little bit of help from Valley. Then we got Virginia. Virginia had very similar requirements, not to speak this out, I know you're tired. Similar requirements to the state of Tennessee, but basically they say if you get these type of injuries, you're a priority patient, then you have to be transported to the closest level one or level two trauma center. Okay? Historically, that's been the Coastal Valley and Bristol Regional Medical Center. But now, the Coastal Valley and Bristol is downgraded to a level three. It basically takes Bristol and Kingsport totally out of play for those folks. So, for many people in Virginia, you're going to end up having to fly over or drive through. Bristol or Kingsport to get to Johnson City. And for many of those folks, it's actually going to be closer for them to actually go to the level two trauma center in Pikeville, Kentucky than it is to go to Johnson City Medical Center. That is bad for the patients there, it's bad for their families, bad for EMS. Ladies and gentlemen, I, uh, I think that there is a better way. You know, where our trauma center today Again, here I can help it. We actually have a very excellent trauma system today. We have two level one trauma centers, we have a level two trauma center, all appropriately located, all providing high quality trauma services to enable everybody in our entire region to have timely access to critical definitive care. And they want to take that away. Now have a single level one trauma center, least appropriately located, and two token level three trauma centers serving the remainder of the area. It's certainly not better trauma care locally or for the region. There's no way in the world that you can spin it any different than that. I think that basically what we need to try to do is that we need to understand that there's very little difference in the capability of a level one and level two trauma center. 
I would love to be able to say that we're going to have success in being able to maintain and build up a promise in our coast of Valley. I don't know realistically that we do. But I do think that we must, we must keep Coast of Valley and Bristol Regional as a strong, capable level to possible because they're going to be able to provide the great majority of what the level one can. And not only do they provide strong, capable trauma care, they also provide strong, capable medical care. And that's what we need to do for our region. With that, folks can basically, from the scene, be taken to those trauma centers. There they can be evaluated by a level two trauma team, not just a general surgeon, but a strong level two trauma team. And after aggressive intervention and even definitive care, if that level two trauma team basically find, determines that they need additional help at a level one trauma center, then let that level one trauma, or level two trauma team, be the ones to determine who needs to go on the Johnson City, not your paramedics in the field. At least they would be stabilized and transferred with a stabilized form so that they have an excellent chance to survive. You know, one of the things that I didn't speak about and I think is very important is that as a level three trauma center at Kingsport and Bristol, we lose, lose something that's very important to all of us here and that's redundancy. You hear Ballard talk about, we want to get rid of expensive, duplicate services, okay? That makes wonderful sense in the business world, but it's lousy when you're talking about saving lives. Redundancy is what it's all about for those of us who are involved in emergency services. You know, what happens today if we have an accident out at 81 and 26 and we have seven or eight people that are critically injured? That would overwhelm any one of our trauma centers. But today, because we have strong, capable trauma services in both, those patients can now be dispersed to those other trauma centers where they can all receive timely definitive care. As a level one, I mean, as a level three center, I don't know that they would done this, it will still be available. We've also been very fortunate over the last 30 years to have developed some very wonderful life-saving resources here in New Bristol. We've also been very lucky that we have not had a major mass casualty of the interim major disaster. But ladies and gentlemen, those of us who are old enough should not forget some of the things that have happened here. You know, the Cherry Hill tornado, tornado in my code, the disaster at Eastman, the chemical exposure there, and the real, the near disaster at Tennessee Eastman recently. If we do not maintain these vital regional resources and their emergency capability, when that mass casualty of the end of the disaster occurs, we simply will not be able to take care of the patients in that effective way. So it's important that we actually we do all that we can to maintain that. So again, I will try to close here and say that I do think that if we could at least maintain the Coastal Valley and Bristol Regional as a level two trauma center, that it would solve most of the adversity that this decision has created. It would resolve the Virginia Trail and the triage issues. It would help with the tennis and destination guideline problems. It would provide high quality medical and trauma care for all of the region. It would help reduce unnecessary patient and family travel. It would aid our EMS agencies. It would maintain that needed redundancy. It would preserve the value of regional resources and improve emergency preparedness. It would even actually help Johnson City in that it would prevent overload of patients going to Johnson City that could have otherwise been taken care of locally. That would have prevent Johnson City from having to expend the additional capital immediately to try to add on to their intensive care units and build additional follow pads and enlarge their emergency department. It would also meet COPA and it would reduce the economic impact on Kingsport and Bristol. But more importantly than anything, it would help us to save lives and that's what it's all about.
mission to the valley forward and to make people understand your concerns and make them aware of it. Quite frankly, I don't believe a lot of the valley board understands this part of it. I doubt they ever have heard it before. So please stand up, be humble, stand tall. You know, for the last 30 years, I think that you guys have had the best cancer survival possible if you're facing a major medical or trauma emergency. We deserve no less tomorrow. So stand up and fight for it, and we will make it happen.
Danny Cook is a lot of things. A mom, a disabled veteran.
And she called me. It was a Wednesday. I remember clear as a bell. And she said, Mom, I got to home and get a bag because they're going to put me in the hospital. And I said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, what? I was like, they're going to put you in the hospital. When? And she said, today. And, she, and I said, well, what's going on? And basically, not to go into too much detail, she wasn't getting the nutrients that she needed. It had stopped. The flow had stopped. She was 26 weeks and a couple of days at that point. So I managed to pack a bag and leave Atlanta, Georgia. And I think I left at like, I don't know, 2 ish, 2 30 ish in the afternoon. And I was in Hostel Valley parking lot at 6. <laughs> That's 2 2 driving. That was 2 2 driving. <laughs> and here's what I'll tell you I was praying the whole way up here. Because I wasn't sure if my daughter was going to make it, if my grandbaby was going to make it. And I, that's all I knew how to do. And I got here and I met these amazing people. Yeah, you agree? And two days later, Bella was born, weighing one pound and three ounces. They gave us like 1.4 and, and 4.5 because of all the tubes and stuff that was laying on top of her. Uh, but they said, best guess was 1.3. She was the size of a big pen. She had a moderate sized hole in her heart. Her lungs weren't developed. Her digestive system wasn't working. May of this, of this year, we sit in this very room with some nurses that I would lay down my life for. But what do we do 
So if it's okay with you, I want to arm you with some knowledge, and then I'm going to give you some things that you can do to make a difference. Fair enough? All right. So first things first, let's talk about this COPA. It's a lot of legal jargon, <laughs> but I want to give you the most important part that I think. My big geek, that's my granddaddy, can y'all tell you here, mouth? <laughs> she might get that from her too. All right, so a couple things that, if you've heard me talk before, you've heard me say this, but I want to tell you where it comes from. If your state legislatures, if your state senators, if your congressmen, if your senators, if they tell you you're just stuck with this COPA, they're lying to you. Because here's what it says. Page two of the COPA says, uh, this COPA is subject to modification if at any time the department, the part meaning the, the department means the state health department, determines that the likely benefits resulting from the cooperative agreement no longer outweigh any disadvantages attributable to any potential reduction in competition that may result from the COPA. In other words, folks, if we can demonstrate that there is a significant public disadvantage, there's a disadvantage to the things that they want to do, this COPA can be modified. They can pump the brakes on ballot health and they can say, hold on a second. We didn't just give you a clear bill to do whatever you want to. Now, Rusty Crow, Gary Hicks might have tried to make that happen, but it didn't. And I'm gonna go ahead and explain that for you guys. When Gary Hicks says to you, it all happened before me, not true. As I told him in Hawkins County. <laughs> Here's the deal. HB 2020 <laughs> is the house bill that they, that he sponsored in order to hide certain information in this COPA, okay? That House bill, when they first took it to the State Health Department and to the Attorney General's office, was way too broad, and they made them go back and make changes. And when they finally got a version that they, that they were willing to pass, then it became SB 2048, right? And that's the one that Rusty Crow sponsored in the Senate. So Gary Hicks in the House, Rusty Crow in the Senate, is how you got this bill it allows them to keep information from you. And that's a fact. I'm not picking on anybody, I'm just telling the truth. And it's about, it's about time somebody did. Because <laughs> you got some politicians that are running around here making you think they're for you and behind closed doors, they're not. They're taking actions that aren't to your benefit and you elected them. So you get to hold them accountable in my opinion. Okay? So the second thing is this, the COPA can also be terminated. Now, when we talk about terminating this COPA, God, it gets really scary. Because the FTC did not want this murder to take place. You guys know that, right? They came here three different times and they testified and they said, whatever you do, do not do this. And their testimony was really plain. It's a little similar. I'm just gonna skip around a little bit, but did y'all hear about the letter that Commissioner Drosner put out on December 13th? Basically what he said to Alan Levine, when they sent the information trying to support him to keep closing, um, he said, um, thank you for providing these letters. <laughs> and he said, uh, the department will need additional information. Hold on, I just lost a mic. This is really not. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, you know, it is what it is. Okay, I'm back. Okay, let me give myself a little leeway. We're just getting real intimate, real friendly, aren't we? Okay, we're all family now, okay. But uh, here's, what, here's what he says. He said, the information provided to date is largely general in nature without a sufficient level of detail or specificity, and the department may supplement the list below as it learns more about this proposal. Guys, this is what they did the entire time. Every plan that Ballot Health has given you has been general in nature and a lack of specificity because they have no clue how they're gonna pull it off. In case you didn't figure that out, they are robbing Peter to pay and Paul and talking really, really nice and hoping you don't pay attention. That's the deal. But you can change it with this COPA. Now the COPA is coming up for an annual review. They do it locally, and then they have to do it at a state level. Here's what I'm asking, and this is what I'm gonna ask you to do. The first one is January 22nd. It's gonna be at Northeast State. I encourage you to come out. It's open to the public. But the second one is the big one. That's the one that the state is gonna be a part of. And what I'm asking the state to do, and what I want you to ask the state to do, is move it here. Because I don't think you should have to figure out how to pay to Nashville, 
I don't think you should have to figure out how to take time off from work and pay for a hotel room so that you can voice your concerns about your health care when they put you in this situation. Call me crazy. Those are the babies that they're really, really concerned about. 
And those babies, no one's going to argue should we have a level 3 NICU at a children's hospital if possible. There's no argument there whatsoever. Okay? But to, but to negate, number one, that constitutes less than 13% of all the babies in our NICU. Did you know that? Less than 13% of our babies are very low birth weight babies. So I want to leave to use statistics that actually apply to our NICU and to our community. I don't want to hear about Charlotte. I don't want to hear about Atlanta. I don't want to hear about Memphis. I don't want you to bring an organization out from California and tell me what to do with our trauma centers, sir. I want you to go out to the holler. Do you know what a holler is, Alan?
That's the last company he worked for. And he was the president of the entire Florida group. He ran 20-something hospitals down there when he was 26. Okay? Those accusations that he said were prior to him were just settled with the Department of Justice in September of this year. It took them six years to finish, and when they did, HMA entered into a three-year non-prosecutorial agreement for $260 million in Medicaid fraud for admitting patients when they didn't need to be admitted and for firing doctors when they didn't admit them. And that occurred between 2008 and 2014. Now, when did I say Adam Levine went there? From 2010 to 2014. I'm gonna say it until I'm blue in the face. Sir, we're country, but we ain't stupid. That matters to me. It matters to me that prior to that job, he worked for the government. He was the secretary for the Department of Health and Hospitals in the state of Louisiana. Guess what he did? He fought Medicaid fraud. country, but I ain't stupid. <laughs> right? If you work for the government, and both of your government jobs for Jim Bush and Jindal in South Carolina and Louisiana, if all of your jobs are when you work for the government to crack down on Medicaid fraud, and you give articles that talk about how easy the system is to exploit, and how you just got to crack down on it and close all these gaping holes, and then the company that you go to work for, somehow, I don't even reckon how, <laughs> commits $260 million of Medicaid fraud, just call me crazy. I'm not saying you did anything wrong. I'm not saying that, because I don't know. I just read really well. <laughs> and I have common sense. <laughs> Draw from that whatever you would like, okay? I'm gonna tell you something else that I've said that someone else was quoted, and I'm gonna give you all I know to be true. In the month of November, there were eight babies. Six of them were from um, Indian Path, and two were from Lux and Pine. Those eight babies, the closest level three NICU was Holston Valley. Okay? Nothing had changed in their designation. Nothing has still changed in their designation. Those babies were taken to Nice Wonder instead. Okay? Now, I don't know their medical condition. I don't know whether that's where they needed to go. I just know that they're a level three, and Holston Valley's a level three, and Holston Valley was closer. And what I can tell you is that two of those babies expired. I do not know, and I cannot say, that transport had anything to do with it. All I know is I would have no doubt if they were taken to the closest level three NICU. Does that not make sense to anybody else but me? Right? I can't call you, I'm not saying, I'm not saying that that's the cause, I've never said that. What I know is, no one would have any doubt if you'd simply done what seems to be the right thing. I want you all to do a couple of things. I want you, how many of you guys go for treatment at Allendale? Does anybody currently go to Allendale? Okay. Um, I want you to take a look at your costs and your bills and see if they've changed since the merger, since before ballot and, and after ballot, okay? Ask for itemized bills because you know they changed the system that you log into now. Like you can't get itemized bills anymore unless you go to the hospital and ask for them in person. Can't imagine why that would be either. Um, but I want you to look at your bills. If you go to the emergency room, look at your bills. I actually know someone who got a bill for over $2,000. By the time they got the itemized bill and compared it with their medical records, they got a bill for less than $200. If you go to the emergency room and they ask you about your insurance and you're in the emergent, and you're in the emergent state, you need to report them. That's an MTALA violation. You're going to have to fight for your rights, folks. You're gonna have to talk to your neighbors. You're gonna have to make your neighbors fight. You're gonna have to not get tired. Don't get bored. Stay on it. Because you're in for a long fight. 
I would be lying to you if I said I'm going to be able to twinkle some pixie dust and everything's going to be okay. It's not true. I don't have an easy fix for you. The hospitals you had no longer exist. And we're going to have to create something entirely new. And we're going to have to determine, is that ballot help with the COPA that we trust is being overseen the way that it needs to? And if so, what does that look like? For me, it means every CEO of ballot gone. Woo! Okay, 
they control 78% of inpatient care. But let me tell you what they're not allowed to do. They're not allowed to tell other facilities, um, for example, other hospice providers, other rehab facilities. They're not allowed to limit their interaction with the doctors in an effort to control the monopoly, but they're doing that. They're telling those folks you can't bring these physicians lunch. You can't meet with them at the hospital anymore. And let me just show you two pieces of information. And I'll go and I'll pass them out. One is when Halston Valley was Wellmont. Okay? This is as Valley Health. These are your patient choice letters. When you get ready to be discharged, they're supposed to tell you where to go for your follow-up care, right? What's supposed to happen is they're supposed to give you all the available options, whether it's theirs or not, okay? So here's what you can see. Up above here, it says Wellmont Health Systems Healthcare Network. These are all Wellmont facilities. But right here, a line provider, and there's all the names of them. Y'all see that? So it's about a 50-50 split at the very top of the page, ain't it? They're not hiding anything. This right here is the new patient choice list. All of that is valid health. All the way down to right here where it says option two. And what it says as option two, we have an established a network that includes certain facilities to ensure the coordination and quality of your care. A list of these facilities is available upon request. They list nobody else's name except their own. I sent this to the FTC about a month ago. They responded back and said, thank you, they're reviewing it. I hadn't ever told anybody that. Well, not for Valley to know, but I figured it's been a month, so they can't really do jack about it now. So, here we go. Folks, when you get ready to get discharged, Tennessee and Virginia are both one-party consent states, which means you can record the conversation and you don't need their consent. If you're an employee, I want you to be mindful of HIPAA violations, but if you're the patient, and you're about to be discharged, and you're being told about your care, record the conversations. If they are trying to push you to valid facilities, if they do not give you the other options, it's an antitrust violation. I'm gonna ask you to do work and give me evidence. Okay, fair enough? Next piece I wanna give you, and this one's new. I'm gonna say a name I've never said before. I'm excited. <laughs> Because every time I dig a little bit deeper, I just find somebody else that's just dead deep in the dirt. And I'm just like, really? Like, I know it's the South, but it's not supposed to be this incestuous. Okay, so here we go. Lynn Kruptak. She is the Chief Financial uh, Officer for Valley Health. She's the CFO, controls the money, right, at Valley Health. Here's why you should care. In last year, in April, when there was no COPA oversight, Greenville, uh, there was a, it's a health and facilities board, right? Health and, health and education facilities board. Basically a group of guys that are like presidents of banks <laughs> that have a lot of money who usually don't meet because they haven't met for several years. Uh, Alan Levine, they didn't need these bonds done. They needed to reduce their debt. And so they had this meeting and the board said, yeah, we'll give you $950 million in bonds. Conduit bonds is what they're called. Now, here's what's interesting. When you go to file the SEC stuff for these bonds, it says the bonds are purchased by PNC, PNC Bank, PNC Capital Markets, right? Why do you care about that? Because Lynn Krutek, here's what it says. Krutek is a current member of various healthcare and finance organizations, including the ETSU College of Business Advisory Board and the PNC Bank Healthcare Advisory Board. Now the bond says, Neither the board, nor its directors, offices, officers, or agents control or participate in any way the management of the operations of the parent. The parent is valid health. Now here's what I'm trying to figure out. A, is she compensated as being part of the PNC board? Even if she's not, it's still a conflict of interest, right? B, where does she fit in the limited role of, 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 of the financing, the board financing, and is this an SEC violation? So here's what I think, folks. I think you have an FTC violation happening. I think you have probably an SEC violation happening. And I think you have a DOJ issue happening. All three. And they're not going to listen to just little old me. It's going to take every single person in this room. 
every single person in this room. I don't expect you all to do all the research that I'm doing, but I just need you to give me the facts to be able to support you and what needs to happen. In my world, here's what I see. It's important for you to know they don't have the $308 million that they committed to in the COPA. They said it in the bonds. They literally said they were gonna get that money from cutting your services, reducing employment, consolidating services, closing down your big U and your P's, and your surgery centers and your trauma. That's where they said they were gonna get the money from. So it's scary, because what if they financially fail? Where does that leave you? Well, here's what I can tell you. They've only committed to keeping your hospitals open for five years, and one of those years is already gone. So no matter what it looks like, you're gonna have to fight, and you're gonna have to fight long and hard. I promise you that I'm not going anywhere. Commissioner Dreiser's replacement. 
I have sent an email asking for confirmation as to who that is. The name that I've been given is someone who used to work with Alan Levine. So, so I'm praying nobody's that dumb. Um, just saying. Um, but I want you to go ahead, you can go ahead and start to contact Bill Lee now and let him know what we expect, right? Um, because that's your, new, that's your new governor coming in here. Same thing on the Virginia side, Virginia folks. I don't want you to feel left out or forgotten. The reason why I talk about Tennessee a lot is because the Virginia COPA was a lot shorter and it deferred to a lot of the things in Tennessee. I don't know if you guys know that or not, but you can thank Terry Kilgore for that. Um, he actually was a little upset with Tennessee and said we had too many uh, commitments that needed to be held. So you might want to call up Terry and ask him, does he still think that? Um, and let me see if there's anything else. Any other names? Am I leaving out other names, folks? Anybody who follows me? No? Get with me afterwards. I appreciate you all very much. You have no idea because you sit here and listen to me. And I've, I've just kind of gone all over the place, but I wanted you all to know the important things. There are three things that are legally under review right now. Moving Alago, the NICU is under review as well because they did take action that goes against the COPA without permission. Um, and, and, and a couple of other things. So there are a lot of things I don't put out on social media, but what I can tell you is I have an email from the state of Tennessee saying that the legal, their legal counsel is reviewing the COPA as we speak. So that's a big, big win, okay? You all stay motivated, you stay together, tell your neighbors, email, phone calls, don't stop. You don't stop and we'll do it together, okay? Appreciate you. Y'all know how I am everything? Thank you.